Hey, it's Joe Solari here, and today I have as a guest Daryl Weber. Daryl wrote a book called Brand Seduction. For you folks out there, um, th this isn't somebody we probably have heard of before. He comes out of uh, doing big brand marketing, uh, but when I read this book, I was uh, amazed at some of the concepts that he had come up with, and I think it's going to be really relevant for you authors and how uh, we look at marketing going forward in the next few years. So, Daryl, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Joe. Glad to be here. So, wh why don't you uh, kind of tell us about yourself and then, you know, how you got to this point of being into neuroscience and branding and marketing? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I'm in branding and marketing. I started out in advertising. Um, I actually studied psychology and cognitive neuroscience undergrad uh, in college and was always just fascinated by how the mind works. Um, had kind of read, even outside of my school uh, education, just reading sort of the pop science books on consciousness and memory and stress and decision making, all these sort of aspects of not, not the psychology I think people often think of, which is like um, health or, you know, something wrong with you or really just understanding how we as humans work and process mm. the world around us and how we think and decide. All those kinds of things just fascinated me, even since I was a kid, honestly. I remember always kind of thinking about how does this brain work and how am I seeing the world and um, how do we do these things? It's just I, I still to this day find it uh, amazing and fascinating. Mm. And so that's why I studied psychology, um, but then also had this sort of creative side and wanted to do something more creative. So I got into advertising. I was what's called a strategic planner in advertising, which is um, really f uh, figuring out the message for ads. Like, what do we want to say about these products, right? And so a lot of that's understanding who your consumer is, um, how you're going to be different from the competition, uh, and what message this, this brand or product should stand for, right? Mm -hmm. And so I did that for a while. I was at big global agency, Saatchi and Saatchi in New York. Then I moved to a consultancy called Red Scout, kind of a more boutique, but we worked with big brands, Nike, PepsiCo, Johnson & Johnson, um, and I was advising them on their brand strategy. So again, understanding, you know, how should we talk about our brands? Where can we go in the future? So yeah, so I did agencies, uh, consultancies, and then I actually worked client side at Coca-Cola, obviously one of the largest brands in the world, and um, moved down to Atlanta for that job. I did a, I was global director of creative strategy internally at Coke, kind of overseeing brand strategy for a lot of their brands. So Minute Maid, Powerade, Vitamin Water, Fuse Tea, Fanta, Sprite, Coke, worked kind of across all those. Uh, great experience, and then left, yeah, a few years ago to write the book. It was really Something that had been on my mind, so having had this psychology background and then having worked in marketing all these years, I really saw this huge disconnect between mm -hmm. how marketers think their marketing works and how they think the consumer mind works uh, and how it actually does, right? Or at least how neuroscientists and psychologists talk about how it works, right? And, mm -hmm. and what they Obviously, there's a lot we don't know, and there's still a lot to be learned, but psychologists and neuroscientists have a decent sense, and they're learning a ton uh, over the years. It constantly is progressing for all these things for, of decision-making and emotions and perceptions. And all these are, should be relevant to marketers and advertisers who are trying to persuade people and you know, put these communications out there and trying to affect people's uh, emotions and feelings to get them to act on something. And I would hear these, you know, very senior marketers at very senior, uh, very large places should be the best marketers in the world, really, just very confidently state these things that having, you know, had my psychology background, I just saw were, were clear myths and misconceptions. Mm. Um, and that was really the impetus to write the book. I said, okay, if all these marketers are, are kind of using their own experience or really just guessing, it felt like, at, at what consumer psychology is about, I said, maybe there's a book that I can write that is not too deep into the science. I, want, I really wanted to make it approachable and accessible for these creative marketers because marketers do think of themselves as creatives. Um, they often come from sort of the creative side or business backgrounds. Um, they, they're often scared of science, right? So mm. I, I tried to make the writing as approachable as possible, plain English, and really just tap into what I find fascinating about the brain and the mind and consciousness. Those things to me are amazing. Um, like I said earlier, and just uh, really interesting into how it actually works. And so I hope the book was a, a way to sort of explain those things and get people excited and interested in like, oh yeah, that maybe that is actually how it works. And maybe that's not how I was thinking it, of it. So hopefully to open their eyes really to, to this new way of, of understanding the mind. Sure, sure. Yeah, you know, and my ex initial experience to it was, you know, behavioral economics versus kind of classical economics. And you, at, you know, University of Chicago, the great thing about that institution is they have both of those people there, right? They've got... Nobel Prize winning 
economists in both fields who tell you the exact opposite, right? Like the one guy is like, there's, there's this rational being that's going to do this out of utility. And then you go into the next classroom and he's like, yeah, but the reality is that there's these unconscious biases that we have and these things that we do that just make you almost trigger you to do things. Um, and you, we're just starting to discover that, you know, why those things. Right. Right. And I, and I so I was, it, when I read your book and saw you tapping into some of those same pieces of research, I was like, wow, this is, this is really relevant to marketing and understanding. So maybe if you could kind of talk about the unconscious that you're talking about, that you're not talking about like subconscious, but, and then how, um, you know, how that, flows and you do a great job in the book and explaining how that there's all this kind of uh, things that it ties into around feeling and emotion. And um, I, I think you'd, people would be really interested in kind of hearing that part. Yeah. Yeah. So it builds off what you said. There was this sort of belief that we as humans are rational actors, right? And that we're doing always what makes the most sense and we're weighing the different options and, you know, making our decisions that way. And, and what all the modern research is really showing is that that's really not true, that we have all these biases, heuristics, they can be called um, fallacies that persuade us and pull us in, in directions that we don't even, we're not even aware that it's happening, um, but they affect our decision making all the time. Uh, and it, it's really evolutionarily, it, I guess it, it made sense in the past, right, where our, we had to make quick decisions, we had to know what was in our environment really quickly and, and see, is this friend or foe, can we eat that or not, right, all these quick decisions <laughs> we had to make. And in that world, maybe it made sense, but now in our modern world, uh, it kind of can lead us astray uh, often. Um, and not that it's always bad, it's just not how the world, how, how it's actually working. I think that was one of the most interesting things I found, was that our, our daily conscious experience is often more an illusion, actually, uh, than what, what's really going on behind the scenes. So it's almost as if our, our unconscious mind, and there's so many processes going on in it, is giving us a false display to just simplify things. And a lot of um, neuroscientists and philosophers will use the metaphor or, or analogy of a um, computer. So there's all this, you know, detailed stuff happening inside a computer uh, with the chips and electronics and bits and binary. Uh, but if you're just looking at the monitor of a screen, you're just seeing what you need to see. You're seeing the words or the video you're watching or the pictures you're looking mm -hmm. at. Um, and so in a way, it's almost like that screen is, is consciousness. And that's what we get to see as consciousness. But there's so much happening below the surface uh, behind that screen that we can't have access to and we're not even aware of it happening. Um, so I think that that can kind of help show you, right, that like, yeah, maybe we're not aware of everything and maybe how we think our, as we go through the world is not really the whole story. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, <laughs> there's a lot of places I could, I could start with that. Uh, what I thought was interesting, um, the different aspects of it was really just start with like perception, like how do we see the world around us um, and like you know, optical illusions play on this, where we see something, you, you think you see the world around you, and it seems to be a true representation of the world, um, but actually your, your brain is making a lot of jumps and, ex and uh, filling in a lot of gaps. Because uh, if you look at what actually is on hitting the back of your retina, it's mostly black and white, it's upside down, <laughs> it has all these sort of veins and arteries that are in the way that your mind blocks out, you have this actually large um, blind spot on both sides of your field of vision um, that your brain completely covers up that you're generally not aware of. You can do kind of tricks to find it. Um, but, so, you know, so even just as simple as looking around the world and seeing this full, rich, colorful, sharp, in focus, right side up world around you is a process that your brain is doing to make it look that way. It's not the raw ingredients coming in or, or not that, right? Um, so even things as simple as that, I think, kind of open your eyes to, wow, yeah, there is so much going on below the surface. Right, does that answer? It, yeah. Was it in your book where you talked about the experiment where, or maybe I read it somewhere else where some guy put glasses that like flipped yeah. his vision and then after a certain period of time, it like his brain right, righted the picture? Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a, a thing people still do. Apparently I've heard of grad students still doing it. They sell these glasses. <laughs> um, yeah. So they flip everything upside down. They kind of have a mirror that you're looking into and, and you can see the world, but everything's upside down. And I think it takes, I forget now also, it's like a week or so, uh, maybe two. Uh, you're obviously, it's very difficult. You're trying to you reach in the wrong place, but after a while, you start to s just see things right side up again and everything seems normal. You don't take the glasses off at all. 
And then, of course, when you do take the glasses off after a few weeks, um, it, everything's upside down again, even though you're not wearing glasses and your brain needs a little while to rewire again and flip everything again for you. Yeah, it's amazing stuff. There's so many fascinating studies like that that just show you, wow, <laughs> the mind is doing crazy things that we're not aware of. Yeah, it almost makes it impossible to get the book written, right? You keep digging more and more. Of this There's so research. many, yeah. <laughs> my book is actually much longer than it, it ended up being when I first wrote it. And my publisher was like, you got to cut it down. And I ended up, you know, cutting out a lot of stories. I'm like, oh, this is a great one, but I got to kill it, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So why don't you um, explain, like, you have this concept of the brand fantasy. And this is kind of one of the big things that I clued in on when I was uh, reading your book, you know, authors, fiction authors, that this is what they do is they create a, an illusionary world. They're great world builders. They tell a story in that world. I mean, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, the hero's journey in your book and, um, you know, the whole Jungian psychology. A lot of authors are using that as kind of their story structure. Mm -hmm. So for me, um, one of the big things that I think is a challenge for authors is, is when they're looking at marketing, um, they're, they're looking to the, the wrong place. Like they look to digital marketers, they look to direct marketing, they're like the, the sideshow trying to get people to come into the carnival, right? right? Versus in what you describe is this creating this brand fantasy is something they're actually inherently really, really good at. And if they can take some of your ideas and blur the lines between the actual product, right, the book, and that world there, and the real world, you know, what kind of opportunities are there, and what kind of thoughts do you, I mean, there's a lot of questions buried in here. Yeah, yeah, no worries. <laughs> but, but that's really where I was like, wow, I got to talk to this guy, because I think that there's this, this magical place, whereas it might be, like you've told me, it's hard in, you know, the advertising world to get people to understand that fantasy piece. I mean, th these people here, they, you know, not only their customers, but the writers, they spent a lot of time in that fantasy world. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. They're, they're probably starting from a great place for it. Marketers, I think, fall into the trap of thinking they need to sell the functional, rational aspects of their products, right? So they're always trying to say, oh, we're better for these reasons, and this is why you should choose our product, which makes sense rationally. That's how, again, we, we would think we would make decisions. Um, but what all this research has shown is that we're not so rational. You actually have to tap into emotions and show um, well, so this is where marketers, I think, get confused. So a lot of marketers are aware of this now. There was kind of this shift, however many years ago, a couple decades ago, really, where it's like, okay, we're not just going to focus on the rational selling points. We're going to try to be more emotional. And if you even see over the last 10 years, probably all the um, digital ads you got and, and a lot of ads on TV, they're all about trying to make you feel an emotion. So they were trying to get you to laugh or cry, right? There were all these really sad, touching uh, viral videos that went around with like piano music playing and you're crying by the end of it, even if it's selling, you know, soap or, or shampoo or whatever it was. You know, the Dove Real Beauty Sketches was one of these big popular ones, if, if you guys have seen that. Um, but I, I think that was actually uh, too literal of an interpretation of what we mean by tapping into emotions. So marketers heard this. They said, okay, I'm not going to be so rational. I'm not just going to focus on the product benefits. Those are, are still important, but I'm also going to like try to tap into these emotions or reach consumers emotionally. But what I try to explain in the book is that what we mean by emotions isn't just like if I laugh or cry at your advertising. It's actually more subtle and nuanced than that. It's more of a feeling I have towards something that's either positive or negative. Um, and so again, going back to evolution, this was our brains were constantly soaking up information around us that we weren't even aware of. This is called a low involvement processing. In psychology, where even if you're focusing on one thing, your brain is kind of uh, absorbing, taking in the people you meet, the things you see all around you. And the more you f familiarize yourself with those things, the more you tend to like them, you trust them more, um, and you could be positive towards them. And it's also kind of grading and rating things with a positive or negative feelings. Um, some psychologists have called this a somatic marker. So you have this kind of bodily feeling towards something, even if you don't know where that feeling came from, but it was probably your unconscious that had been uh, rating it through the years as you've had different exposures to whatever that, that thing is. And this is true for anything you experience, people, places, things, brands, books. <laughs> um, so you're kind of always having that low level uh, awareness of things and, and, and grading them and rating them. Um, 
and then your body creates this feeling towards it positively or negatively. And so what I, my point is to marketers is that you're actually trying to shape that somatic marker, that, that unconscious feeling towards your brand in a positive way. Uh, and there's another aspect of cognitive psychology where they talk about the network of associations, where any concept you have in, the, in your mind uh, will be connected to all these other related associations. So if you think of the idea of a doctor, even just saying that word doctor, without you realizing it, it, it activates all these other rel related associations. So things like hospitals and nurses and stethoscopes and white coats and uh, medicine and sickness, all these things now are activated slightly in your mind just because I activated the word doctor. And all those things are related. And you could say that's the, the network of associations for doctor. And so a brand or a product or a service or a book will also have a network of associations connected to it. And it is that combination of associations, this kind of, I almost think of it as like a messy soup of associations because there's so many and it kind of goes out infinitely and they're all connected to all of their different relations. So it's very complicated, but you can think of it as like, what do I want my associations to be? for my brand or product? How do I want to shape that, those, that network of associations? And you know, most marketers aren't thinking of it that way today, um, but we do know that there are these unconscious associations to your brand, whether you try to do it purposefully or not, if you, even if you don't have the intent, there, those associations will come on their own. So my point was, can we be more strategic and smarter about shaping and building those network of associations? And that's what I call the brand fantasy. Um, that your fantasy then is this group of associations connected to your brand that shapes this unconscious feeling, that somatic marker that um, a, your con end consumer or your end reader will have towards your brand or product. Mm. So my push is, okay, don't, you're not just trying to be emotional in the way of laughing or crying. You're actually trying to shape this feeling towards your brand. That's what's actually going to drive uh, people to choose and buy your brand over the competition if it feels right for them. So if it feels in, like in a certain way of cool that I want it to be or if it you know, taps into some deep need that I have, right? It, you have to somehow like articulate what do I want that to be. And it, it, it can be very abstract. So I, I push people to use images or characters or music or your movies, um, anything like that that can bring, bring to life this feeling of your brand that you want to attribute it to. So if, if you think of, you know, brands, um, you know, take cars, Lexus will have a certain feeling to it versus a Mini Cooper versus a Jeep, right? Um, mm -hmm. You can see the yeah. network of associations for each of those brands would be very different, right? And what appeals to me as a consumer is partly knowing who am I as a consumer? What do I care about? What are my needs and concerns? What, what are the other brands out there doing? What are their networks of associations? And how do I want mine to be different and stand on its own in a way that's relating and connecting to my target audience? That was a lot there. <laughs> yeah, it was, but it's good. It's good. And it kind of, you know, so here's the interesting thing about authors is that um, they're in a unique position to be able to not only, uh, you know, they have the product, which is the book, but there's also this experience, right? The, the readers are, that's what they want is the experience. It's not like, it's like, oh, I, I really think it's good that I read, not, you know, 10,000 words a day. That's not what they're buying. It's, they want it. It's that entertainment. It's that engagement. And, you know, some of the work that I've seen around how um, characters activate in, in readers' brains, similar to real people and their familial associations. Yeah. So knowing that, this, that authors are in this unique position that they can create the world, right? That they can create these characters and that their, their consumer willingly steps into this world you know, what, what are kind of your thoughts off the cuff, the ways that they can play with those ideas and, and use that to, you know, to getting to your book title, seduce their, uh, <laughs> their readers. Right. Uh, yeah. So w where I was going with it before was, yeah, instead of, you know, marketers often have a functional benefit that they're trying to sell. Authors, they're already creating this fantasy world and that's, you know, that is their product almost, right? That's what they're selling. Like you said, you're inviting people into that fantasy world. So now it's about communicating that world to your target audience and, and getting them to want to buy into it and want to take that journey with you um, and dive into it. So it's funny to hear you say that, you know, they're probably trying to take tips from marketers and they're trying to do the digital ads um, where it probably will get too salesy and they're trying to sell their book in a way rather than making it about 
what is that fantasy world that you've built and, and teasing it up to people and giving them a taste of it so that they want to, to be pulled into it, right? And that it's intriguing. And it's, I guess, you know, similar to movie trailers or something like that, where you're giving a, a tease for here's the experience you can have with this, you know, if, if you want to dive into it. Let, let me give you a little bit, a little taste um, so that you know what the feeling is you're going to get from it. And like you said, yeah, the need that you're solving isn't that I'm going to read so many words or that I'm going to have read a book. It's, it can be escapism or uh, it, I think it can actually be deeper than that. And I'm just thinking off the cup here, but um, I think, you know, humans have a desire for connection uh, or spirituality um, or things like that, right? That they can get through a novel uh, and connecting with characters and through a story and through deep emotion that they would be feeling with those. And they, they, they're craving those things, right? And that's why they want that kind of entertainment uh, and to get wrapped up in a story and lost in it. Um, so I think if you can be clear on what maybe that need is that you're solving and how you're kind of connecting with your target audience, then the, the challenge is to invite them into that. Say, here's, here's that spirituality, that connection, that um, emotions that you, you're wanting to feel you can get it through this book, right? Or, or I'm going to give you some of that. And obviously you don't say that as literally or as directly as that. You kind of show it um, and, and make it come to life in certain ways. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I imagine there's, there's creative ways to do that if that's introducing a character, right? Or like um, showing bits of the experience or talking through the voice of one of your characters or showing a scene from some of one of your books and just um, things like that. And I, I, you know, and I'm obviously a novice in, in the, book marketing space. So, you know, I don't know that much about it, but I wonder if you can borrow things from how movies and other forms of entertainment uh, market themselves as well. Cause I, I know they do that kind of thing also. Yeah. So I think it's something we were talking a little bit when we got started is how marketing's changed for authors, right? So go back 20 years, even say 10 years ago, you, you're as an author, you were trying to pitch your book so you could get an agent and they get you a publisher and that publisher was responsible for doing that marketing. Now with authors stepping into this, um, where their success has been is using tri these newer digital marketing techniques. And, you know, you think about something like Facebook is, uh, was very powerful in the beginning because you could target interests like, Hey, if you like star Wars, I can find people that are into star Wars and I write uh, space opera. Guess what? They're probably like my book. Like it's pretty, pretty direct. And they would follow those same ideas of marketers as like, in essence, is buy my book. Or if you like that, then you'll like this. Right. Whereas um, it's a different, it's a different medium, you know, and a different audience. I, I is probably, I should probably preface this. Where mm. The advantage an author has is that um, their, their consumer uh, that's either going to read or listen to the book is is setting themselves up to make that kind of time commitment. Right. Um, and in that, in that product, you're going to be able to really connect them with their characters. So there's, there's almost like this feedback loop that once you get somebody like, you know, you think about it, that we started to segment customers, right? There's the marketing that you would use with kind of what's the brand fantasy to bring people into the fantasy. And then what do you do to help them to, um, you know, really feel part of that community and that spirituality and the, you know, that sense of belonging, because in the, at, in my view, what you really want, where the best marketing happens is you and I are sitting at a coffee shop and you ask me about what I've been reading and one, you respect my choice in books. And I say, Hey, I just read this great book by Daryl Weber. And you're like, Oh, cool. And you get on your phone and you buy it, right? Like what's more powerful than that? But yeah. you know, the stuff that you have, um, talked about in your book is isn't that direct it's it's kind of painting all those colors and flavors around that so if you could kind of speak to that yeah right it is less of a direct sale in a way it's still understanding who your target audience is and yeah if they did like certain things within the genre probably being really clear about that genre and understanding that that target audience um, but, and then understanding their needs and wants and desires and how you can fit what you're selling to match up with their desires. Um, but then you're right. It's, it's less of a hard sell um, and more of a imbue your brand or product or book in this case uh, with the right sort of feeling, mood, and vibe 
uh, that's going to make people attracted to it in a way, right? Uh, and so that can be through very subtle things. So definitely, I still think you have to focus on what you say and the conscious aspects of your 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 message. Um, and yeah, if that is, uh, you know, I. However, whatever your message is, if that's targeting people who liked a similar kind of book or whatever, uh, but then it's, it can be through these subtle ways of what sort of, um, who do I show, what types of models, what's the look in their eye, what emotion are they showing, what colors and fonts am I using, all those little things are part of creating this world and this feeling that you're going to have towards this, right? Is this modern? Is it medieval? Is it classical? You know, um, whatever it is, but that you're painting that full picture and that it feels really rich, right? And um, yeah, it's kind of tapping into something with them uh, deeply and emotionally. Yeah, <laughs> right? It, I feel like it would be hard to sell a book. Yeah, and if you're trying to build word of mouth, it's like if you can stir that emotion in one person, and that, I mean, that's the product itself is going to be the best marketing for you, right? So obviously mm. having a book that creates that emotion and that connection and that makes people really feel something that they then want to share with someone else is probably, you know, the best marketing you could have. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, that's, you know, from what the industry's kind of discovered, there's certainly cues that are out there. Like, look, talk about book covers for a quick second yeah you know um when the indie publishing movement first started book covers i mean people were kind of doing their own book covers and you could tell like oh that's not a great book cover in a real quick uh period of time that's changed and not only is the book cover quality gone way up but there's very very clear uh indications of what the book genre is just by looking at that cover, right? Like there's a reason why I say you can't judge a book by its covers because we judge books by their cover. Right. <laughs> um, totally. So like if you, you look at, um, you know, a genre like epic fantasy versus urban fantasy, right? They're fantasy books. There's magic in them both, but how they present what's on the cover is different, very different. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that that's one area where like authors have figured it out and are seeing how they can use that as a tool but you bring this to this whole nother level of like, you called it with the somatic marker. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about like that and how, how you reinforce that. Yeah. So I work a lot with graphic designers and they, I think, get this intuitively. Like they know when they are creating a logo or what we call a visual identity for a brand, that the shades of color that they use, the types of fonts, the, how they lay it out is all going to be super important for how this brand eventually feels, right? And how people connect to it. Not just like popping off shelf or catching attention, but actually like telling you what the personality of this brand is and what, what I can expect from it. Um, there, you know, there's tons of beautifully designed products, but I often find that designers know it more uh, intuitively than the marketers I'm working with, whereas, you know, marketers are trying to get sort of functional features and benefits put on their packaging designs. Uh, the designers know, no, it has to look this certain way. It has to look premium or accessible or, you know, if it's food, it has to look warm and friendly and inviting, all, all these things, right? Whatever it is and how you're going to differentiate, even if it's those act in like not a conscious way, right? It's not part of the conscious message, but all those little details are going to communicate so much about what this brand is about and what the product is inside. Um, and it's totally judging a book by, a cover, by its cover. I think we do that all the time with people we meet. We judge them by what they're wearing, how they look what, with their facial expressions. We do it instantly and automatically. And we do the same with products that we see in the world. And I think, yeah, I was thinking book covers earlier. So thank you for bringing it back. But I think that's huge, huge hugely important. Um, it's the first impression you're going to get. People, you know, have this sort of blink, quick response, a feeling that they get, are they attracted to it or not? Uh, and so how you design that cover is going to say so much about what is this world inside that, that you're inviting me into. Um, and so it, it, you know, obviously you're not, there is no like conscious functional message when you're selling a book, but I would try to be really clear with what is the feeling, that world that you've created inside, what is the journey you're going to take your reader on uh, and can you tease that right and show it in the in the in the cover because um, that's going to speak volumes far more than what's written on it right if an image is a thousand words that image that is going to give you so much more at at first glance than even what's written on the back of the book mm. 
or what blurbs you're going to read, right? You're going to get well, an yeah. emotional connection to an image quickly and automatically before you then consciously have to read something about it. Well, and you, when you look at the, the context now where most of those images are digital and they're thumbnails, you know, they're tiny, tiny. things that you see, you know, you have to, it could be just color. It could be just the silhouette of the character on it. It could be the first thing that brings you, okay, now I see the picture. Now I go another layer. Like, it, it, um, yeah. there's, a, there's a lot to it. <laughs> Yeah, and the other piece is uh, we, naming in brands and marketing and title in books, right? Um, the title is super important. And I'm sure you guys know that. But again, it's a, that first introduction and then, you know, it's quickly processed. And what does it tell you about it? What does it make it feel like? What does it sound like in the mouth and on the tongue? And, um, you know, the rhythm of it, all that is going to give you a, an impression for, you know, what's inside. You know, I was just, I actually last night went to a, a beer tasting and, the alcohol category is something I've worked in a lot and I find fascinating, but there was this new beer that a friend of mine was trying to introduce to the other friends around and it was called Kegnog, <laughs> like eggnog. Yeah. Um, clever name. So he, this guy's a super beer geek and he's at a huge beer store with literally thousands of beers he set on the shelf. And that one, he just noticed the name and it had a very Christmassy design on it. Right. And it's, and it's like, Oh yeah, I think it's going to have Christmassy flavors like cardamom and clove and allspice or what, you know, whatever. It's going to mm-hmm. have those kind of eggnoggy spices to it, but he didn't know that, but it just felt like it was going to. And then actually when you taste it, it can trick your perceptions, right? Cause your expectations can so filter or, you know, adjust your, what your perceptions actually then become that he was saying he tasted it. But then the other friends who were saying it, you know, like, I don't really know if I taste those things in it. And then we're looking at it. There's not actually brewed with those things, but his expectations were so high that it was going to be this Christmas yeah. taste that yeah. he was tasting it. But other people who didn't have those expectations weren't tasting it when they're just getting it in a glass, you know? And I was like, I was fascinated by that. I'm like, Oh man, that, that bottle, the can design and the name cued so much in his head that he had these preconceived expectations that actually changed his tasting of this product that mm-hmm. other people didn't have, right? That's the power of those kinds of perceptions and expectations. And you're setting those with your title and with your book design as well. Yeah. Yeah. It was crazy. I, you were, and if it wasn't in your book, there was in some of the other books I've read about, you know, the, the research around prices of alcoholic products and yeah. I know you talked a lot about some specific alcohol brands in there yeah. and how when you get my wife's family has been in the home brewing wine supply uh, business for like a hundred years like mm. the ingredients are the same right, <laughs> right? <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> um, but you know the difference in what you can charge and what people perceive of the brand just because of the shape of the bottle Totally. Shape of the bottle, the price, of course, the bottle design. There's a study that I think I do mention in the book. Um, I might get the details wrong now, but they told people, they poured the same glass of wine at a dinner and they told people that wine was either from Napa Valley, California, or that it was from North Dakota. I think it was. Um, the same exact wine, right? Mm-hmm. And then they didn't ask people about the wine. They asked them, how would you rate the dinner that you had? thinking the whole dinner, right? Just the food. And the people who got the Napa Valley, they they were told the wine was from Napa Valley, rated the entire dinner experience and the quality and taste of the food higher than the people who were told they got a North Dakota wine, even though everything was exactly the same, right? Um, Not even the wine, they're asking about the food. It's, you know, and so all those kinds of things, yeah, play into our, our minds without us ever realizing or noticing. No, it's crazy. It's crazy, right? And that's the power um, of storytelling too, right? You're, you're bringing to life this whole Napa Valley, California. I have all these associations with that. North Dakota does not sound nearly as good when it comes to mind. <laughs> and then those associations are connected and I connect them to my feeling towards this experience and towards the food. Is there any thoughts you have around maybe prompts or heuristics or things that would be more relevant for authors to use and seeing their products a little bit different? You're not selling like a shampoo, you're selling an experience? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's tons that's been written in the behavioral economics world about these different biases uh, that we can use um, and tap into. There's common ones like um, social proof <laughs> is a classic one. Um, mm-hmm. And so just showing, you know, that's the idea that if a lot of people are doing something, it makes it more attractive, right? And it's something I should probably be looking at too, right? It's the idea, if there's a club and there's a long line outside of it, I want to see what's going on in that club or in that space. Um, and Amazon does this with their reviews, right? So just things like having more reviews, even if they're not all positive, but even if there's just a lot and there's sort of, there's essentially a digital crowd <laughs> at your mm-hmm. book, um, 
that can do a lot, right? So getting sort of numbers and people um, behind it and talking about it, that's you know a clear one social proof. Uh, another one's the availability heuristic is kind of a classic one with this, the idea that the more you see something, the more uh, favorable you feel towards it and you build kind of trust and awareness of it. And so there was a famous study that showed people meaningless images, just kind of sketches of different shapes, and they would repeat a lot of these images. The ones that you had seen more often than others, you rated as liking more than the ones you had seen less often, right? Just total random designs. Uh, so the more you can get in front of your target audience, just with, with uh, repetition, um, will just make them more top of mind also, but actually make them more attracted to it as well. Um, there's lots of sort of tricks like that, and there's definitely other books that go into more of them. Um, I mean, there's, you know, the email list, of course, is, uh, I think, a classic. <laughs> uh, building your email list, it's a way of getting in front of them more regularly, um, but also it's a way of adding value and providing value, and there's this sort of a reciprocity uh, heuristic and bias. So if you're giving something of value to people, then they feel like they want to return it, right? So um, it, obviously, these are authors, they're people who write. If you can be regularly writing and giving people value, and that can be other fiction, it can be short stories, uh, blogging, whatever it is, um, in any form really, uh, through a newsletter, even through Instagram, short stories, something interesting, exciting. If they're getting value from you, they're going to feel positively towards you, right? And feel like maybe this is someone I want to be on their side. I want to support them. I want to help them. Um, just like you're doing with your podcast and, and your writing, and, um, right? So any kind of content, I think, uh, if it's providing value, can get people on your side as well. Yeah, and I, um, I, I, it's something I've talked to a lot of authors about and where this really fits in nicely is that, you know, we, you brought up newsletters. Like a lot of authors know how powerful a newsletter is, especially for a launch, right? If I have a, a decent newsletter list when I get ready to launch my book and I tell these people and they show up on the first day of sales, that's going to help sit my sales rank and it's just going to progress things, right? Yeah. But authors don't like to necessarily write newsletters. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and what I've been talking to a lot of my clients about is, is don't write the newsletter as the author, figure out how you can bring your story world and your, your, your brand into this thing in a way, because you've got a unique situation in that the people that are getting your newsletter are readers. They'll actually read stuff. Like they will sit down and read a, a 90,000 word book in a day. Like there's people, it's crazy, but that if you look at the, like this, you'll, you'll probably find interesting is they're, they're seeing with the romance community, they're not selling as many audiobooks. And one of the reasons that I think that that's happening, and I've talked to some of the people in the industry is because those narrators can't read as fast, can't, read the book as fast as the reader can. Hmm. So they're just not prepared to sit and wait for this guy to read to them. Mm. They, they, they just go through these books. They'll go through a book a day, right? So knowing that you have an audience that loves to read, it's giving them what they want to read, right? And yeah. then that, that – so, um, again, I think that's where your stuff makes sense is how you can, you know, use that – mechanism of the newsletter to create that what you call the brand fantasy yeah like if you could tease it in a newsletter start showing them pieces of that world or introducing them characters or painting a scene for them and teasing like i could see things like that like intriguing people and wanting to pull them in i mean it's great having you on the on the call and and to talk through this stuff um before we kind of go is can you maybe share kind of what you're working on now and kind of things that you see might be helpful for authors and, you know, kind of your current work around brand fantasy? Yeah, I mean, right now I do, I'm a consultant and I'm working with a lot of uh, big companies, all <laughs> names you've, you've heard of um, in a lot of different spaces and technology and beverages and alcohol and startups as well. Um, also working on my own kind of startups uh, and side projects, launching my own brands. And so I'm constantly thinking about where marketing is going in the future, uh, how we can build better brands and products uh, that actually appeal to people. I mean, that's kind of the core of my philosophy of marketing, and I alluded to it earlier, is that it, it really starts with creating better things. <laughs> um, 
if you're creating a better product that actually solves people's needs and their desires and wants, uh, you're gonna, it's gonna be, you know, that much easier. You're not trying to spin something. I, you know, I don't like the type of marketing that's spinning something that people don't want and trying mm-hmm. to get them to want it. Um, and like we said, with word of mouth, right, having a, a great product that's uh, remarkable, as if, you know, Seth Godin, who's a famous marketing author, mm-hmm. um, he talks about had this book, The Purple Cow, right? Something that's different and worth remarking on, like literally remarkable, uh, is the best marketing you can have, right? It's something that's going to drive um, peer-to-peer uh, sale, uh, sales and word of mouth. And mm-hmm. it, that's, you know, you try to build that into the product from the core, right? Something that's differentiated and interesting and that taps into people um, and that they want to share, that they actually will get social credit and social currency by selling, uh, sharing it with their friends. Um, yeah, he has a great book too. I would encourage your your listeners to check it out uh, called This Is Marketing. It's a new book by Seth Godin that I found really interesting and um, talks about really what this new world of marketing uh, should be about. Uh, and a lot of it is this sense of, you know, marketing can be actually a, a force for good and, and mm. positive change in the world. Uh, and I know marketing gets a bad rap, you know, often as trying to trick people or manipulate people. Uh, and I, and I like his point of view, and it's something I've thought about a lot too, of it, it should be in its best sense, something that's helping people and adding value to them in their world, right? And that's actually when it works best. And that's how you're going to build a stronger business really today, truly, right? Is um, building things that improve the world and not tricking people into something. Yeah, uh, and yeah. I think, you know, you, authors are on that side already. They're providing value and entertainment. They're not trying to trick people into something. Uh, but unfortunately, some marketers do get into that world. Yeah, that's for sure. And I think that's where, you know, I'm compelled to do this kind of stuff and bring these ideas to authors is because there is the kind of that dark side and it, especially if it's worked for you in the past where you've kind of had that sideshow, get them in the tent thing and it's been selling your books. But really what we're, you know, we have this great opportunity because we're, selling a world and an experience is that you can build a community and, and I'll, I'll give you a, an example. So I mentioned we were looking to sell the house and my realtor was there and we're talking and for some, for some reason we got talking, my wife made some comment from a Star Trek movie right? and the realtor responded, right? Like, so like there was that instant connection mm. association, you know, how I felt about that realtor changed in an instant, right? Mm. Cause she had that little geek thing going on and it's like I, something I didn't know about her, but now I, I've, a, uh, because of my experience of watching a particular show years ago, now I'm putting that layer around her, right? You know. Authors have that ability, right? Like they have all those tools that like probably your other clients wish they could do. Right. Um, yeah. And once you get that community working um, for you, it could be super powerful. Yeah, totally. Yeah. All right. Well, it's great having you on the show. Um, where can people find you to learn more about you? Of course, the book is on Amazon and all the other real ta- re- realtors, real t- <laughs> retailers, <laughs> retailers, ah! retailers. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, the book's called Brand Seduction. Um, Let's find it anywhere. And uh, my website is daryl-weber.com. That's T-A-R-Y-L-Weber with one B. Um, so you can find me there and, and reach me there. I'm happy to hear any thoughts people have. My email address is on there. So feel free to reach out. Great. Well, thanks for having you on. And we'll put the links down in the show notes. And um, we'll keep in touch because I think the stuff you're doing is great. And it's um, really cutting edge. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, glad to be on. Appreciate it. All right. Bye. Bye.